This is a production of Cornell University. Um, anyway, so this project is looking at what makes a maize plant competitive for resources versus potentially more cooperative in the long run. And I'm also interested in trying to understand how different growth strategies can impact a neighboring plant. And so plant to plant interactions are everywhere within the field and they can have an impact on neighboring phenotypes where for instance, uh, competition within the field could cause extensive yield variation where if you see here, we have more cooperative plants in a uniform stand, you would see these limited neighbor effects versus if you have more competitive plants, you're going to have a more uneven stand in the field and larger neighbor effects, which could impact yield variation. Now, selection dynamics may play a role in competitive ability. And as we've moved from more of a historically individual selection dynamic to more of group selection, as we've moved more towards modern hybrids, we may have seen overall selection for more cooperative plants. However, even in our modern breeding schemes and inbred line developments, we are still seeing early selection on individual plants within the field that later on moves to selections on rows or group selection. Now, with this, we might have inadvertently been selecting for competitive plants early on in our breeding schemes and more cooperative plants later on as we start doing our yield trial evaluations. So despite over a century of this selection, we still get extensive yield variation within our field of genetically identical genotypes and competition for resources may be a driver of this yield variation. And although we know from different ecological studies what traits are linked to competitive ability, we do not yet know to what extent these traits are really playing a role in how different combinations of traits or growth strategies affect a neighboring plant. Now, my hypothesis is that traits relating to resource capture will have the largest competitive effect on their neighbors. And additionally, the response of neighboring plants will vary depending on their own grass growth strategy. And so of particular interest to me are these four traits highlighted here, plant height, leaf length, leaf width, and leaf angle. And I will be focusing on them for the next portion of my presentation. So neighboring rows have been known to impact the phenotype of a particular row being measured, which is why historically four row plots are very commonly used in the field when trying to get an accurate estimate of yield of plants and within a yield trial. So in order to better understand the importance of different traits and growth strategies, measuring these potential neighbor effects in field experiments where a different genotype was planted in each row could provide an initial look into competition dynamics. And so the maize NAM population was grown in this method where we had a unique genotype in each row. And by looking at this population, I have the ability to look directly at 5,000 genotypes across eight locations. And in today's example, looking particularly at four different traits to evaluate these different neighbor effects. Now, by using this data, I am able to estimate the genotype means via uh, BLUPs or GEBVs, and then incorporate the neighbor row effects and ultimately predict performance. So a really simplified model could look something like this, where I'm predicting plant height of say this row two by predicting the height of the self row or row two uh, using BLUPs and then taking the average blob of rows one and three and seeing how those neighbors affect my prediction for the plant height of this central row. And this model can be extended to include multiple traits uh, beyond just height. So things such as leaf length, leaf width, um, the other traits I was discussing earlier. So I ended up generating linear models for each population and each environment, kind of following the general formula shown here, just for plant height. So uh, looking at 
you know, the block for the central row and then the block for the neighboring rows. And the betas, so the weights, were evaluated for their significance. And so I ended up looking at this beta of your neighboring value over the beta of the self or central row value to really start to look at what is the importance of the neighbors relative to this central row. And so shown here um, is a plot where I have all of the different populations and the significance or the importance of the beta neighbor over the beta self. And so as you're looking at this, uh, these lines going across are the general significance thresholds where uh, the beta of the neighbor had a significant term within the model. And as we move away from zero in either direction, that means that the neighboring plants are more important in actually predicting our height of the central row. And so you can see a lot of it is clustering around zero, but there is some variation. So that was of potential interest to me. And that being said, the significant neighbor traits did end up varying by population and environment. So in making a more complex model that included these four traits here, leaf angle, leaf length, leaf width, and plant height, I went ahead and plotted out the number of significant neighbor traits within the models for each location with the dotted line showing the null expectation of how many would occur uh, by random chance. And of interest to me was that New York in 2006 uh, had a much higher level than New York in 2007. And the difference between these two years was that in 2006, all the, the field itself was planted uh, in blocks by population, while in New York in 2007, the field was planted in blocks by flowering time. So that means plants that were of a similar height were grown next to each other. And when breaking this down and looking further at the importance of neighbor traits uh, just within a population across all locations, again, with the dotted line showing our null expectation value, um, you can see that some lines like B97 here did not have any significant neighbor effects for these four traits, while other lines like the CML228 had much larger neighbor effects. Now, while historical data exists for between row measurements, there is you know, little to no data for within row unique mixtures of hybrids. And so by mixing hybrids with different growth strategies, my goal is to start to distinguish what traits are most important towards a plant being competitive or cooperative. And can we start to identify, say, a cooperative mixture versus a more competitive mixture? And so this past summer, I grew a mixed plot experiment where 32 hybrids were grown in unique combinations to evaluate the effects of neighboring plants within a row. So these plants were grown both in mixed and in single hybrid plots. And at the end of the season, I used the single hybrid plots to predict the yield of the mixed hybrids. So by looking at the distribution and total plot level yield, I can start to evaluate the impact that different growth strategies have on neighboring individuals. So shown here would be the hypothetical example of hybrid A and hybrid B and their resulting yield distribution and overall plot level yield. And upon mixing hybrid A and hybrid B, uh, you can see that in this hypothetical scenario, the yield per hybrid is approximately the same um, as what you would see with the two single hybrid plots and our overall plot level yield remains constant. So in this case, we would say that the hybrids have cooperative uh, growth strategies and are not seeing any sort of yield penalty. However, say we're growing a hybrid A and hybrid B together and hybrid A ends up being much taller than hybrid B and shades out its neighbors. Uh, you can see that we've now seen a shift in our yield distribution and that the overall plot level yield is lower. So in this case, um, I would say that there is actually competition between the growth strategies uh, in this mixture. And so looking at my actual data and predicting mixed plot hybrid yield from the means of the single hybrid plots, 
I found that the actual mixed plot yield is able to be predicted rather well in this scenario. Um, and it shows that the hybrids are performing similarly in mixed plots as they do in the single hybrid plots. Now, given that I only have one field season and a limited amount of data from this, I definitely do need more field seasons and data to draw more solid conclusions as to whether there are some hybrids that perform generally the same in mixture um, or better, or if they're always performing worse in mixture as they do compared to when they're grown in a single hybrid plot. So currently, um, what I'm seeing is that competitive ability does not appear to have a large impact in these plant-to-plant -plant interactions for our US improved lines. But come the 2021 field season, I will be growing this mixed plot experiment in five genomes to fields locations. So I have a large amount of data there that I can start to look at. Additionally, I'm further expanding upon my between row models by looking at hybrid data since the NAM data was all on inbreds. And I'm curious if there's a difference between inbreds and hybrids. And additionally, I'm further investigating these traits on the hybrids in my 2020 data set to really see if perhaps there's different contrasting traits um, or if there's any sort of impact there that could be of interest. And so at this point, um, I would like to thank the Buckler Lab as well as the Robbins Lab and my committee members for all of their assistance so far. And I would be happy to take any questions. Great talk, Great talk Amy. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, please, uh, if you have questions for Amy, either type them in the chat um, and feel free to unmute yourself and read them or I can read them or raise your hand. So it looks like we've got a question from Mike Gore. Mike, if you would like to talk, please feel free. Yeah, I'm happy to. Very nice presentation, Amy. Do you think older hybrids developed under low density selection would perform more poorly under mixed planting? That's an excellent question. Um, I think a big factor you'd have to consider would be the density that you would be growing under a mixed planting experiment. If we were growing them under you know, a modern planting density, I would say they would perform poorly because you know, there are a lot of studies that have been done just talking about the density adaptation that's occurred with older yep. hybrids. Um, yep. But at a lower density, you know, that, I guess I'm not quite sure what I would expect to see other than perhaps, you know, maybe there would be more competition just because as we say, you know, we've increased the density, we've increased the cooperativeness of our plants. Um, so I guess that's, maybe more what I would expect to see, but I think that would be a great thing to test out. Cool, thank you, Amy. Do we have any other questions for Amy? Uh, Rebecca Nelson has a question. Hi, yeah, I, I wanted to thank both speakers for great presentations. Um, I was wondering um, to Amy, if I got you right, that you did have some evidence of row to row um, competition and you were come look at these morphological um, variables that might explain that. And I was wondering if you might also have chemical mechanisms in mind, like there's sort of allelopathic type, chemical ecological type ways that plants might try to squelch their, their neighbors. And, and was there any sort of unexplained competition that might be explicable by that kind of mechanism? Yeah, so I didn't really account for or look at non-morphological uh, factors within the models, but there definitely has been some more recent literature that's come out showing that, you know, there definitely could be some sort of, you know, chemical type mechanisms. Uh, I would expect to see that more within a row versus looking between rows as you're going to have, you know, more direct interactions looking at roots um, within a row. And so that, could definitely be something of interest to look at, um, but it is not you know, something I probably will be able to do in the scope of this project in itself. But you know, based off of some of these papers, I do suspect that you know, there absolutely could be something going on either uh, with the root exudates um, or 
like root interactions, I should say, not necessarily exudates that could potentially cause differences in interactions. But was there a bit of unexplained variation with that that might was left after you accounted for the morphological? Um, I guess I, I would need to go back and look a little bit further at the models because I definitely I only went out to four traits um, and in the future do you want to include more? So I mean, there's definitely in the sense of, you know, are my predictive abilities with these four traits perfect? They're definitely not. Um, so, you know, there, there are more factors absolutely that we could look at. Okay. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for the question. And we have a question from Ricky Tegmeyer. Ricky, do you want to ask that out loud? Hi. Um, yeah, so I was just curious if in a mixed system with different hybrids, uh, all having uh, different expressions of different um, chemical recruiters in the soil would have uh, an effect on what kind of profile of soil microbes you could accumulate uh, in that system. Yeah, so that's a great question and one I've actually been talking to or asking of some different uh, soil people and uh, maze people studying like microbiomes and kind of the general consensus that I have heard, um, although it's definitely up for debate still, is that within a single field season, probably growing unique mixtures um, wouldn't have a huge impact on the soil microbiome, um, but perhaps grown over a longer period of time, maybe you could see some differences. Um, so I guess that's that's what I've heard and I've discussed with people, um, but who knows, there are, there's a lot of people studying just how you know a single hybrid could have a different microbiome than another hybrid in a field. So I think the argument could be made that other way too. All right, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions for Amy at the moment. Um, I'd like to open a last chance questions for either of our speakers here. Um, but other than that, we are out of time. So please remember to fill out the feedback form for our speakers. And thank you, Jack and Amy, for wonderful presentations today. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.